so today we're going to talk about effective altruism. Now, as I mean, I'm sure you've heard of the term effective altruism. It's been kind of in the headlines uh, if you follow kind of newsy events over the last year, uh, in particular regarding two events that I think uh, the effective altruists would actually like to go away because they've got a lot of press on this and they don't get a lot of press for the things that they would like to get a lot of press on. But the one thing I think that really brought effective altruism kind of to the mainstream, if you will, is um, is uh, the FSB. It, it's it's um, uh, the collapse. Sorry, FSB. Where did I get FSB from? SBF. FSB is not even dyslectic. It's the same letters, but just mangled. SBF. SBF um, and um, uh, the the, 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 the collapse of his uh, crypto uh, entity. He was a billionaire one day and basically in jail the next. Uh, committed fraud. Uh, it, clearly, it seems that clearly committed fraud uh, and, uh, and has been prosecuted and found guilty and spend, is going to spend a significant amount of jail, time in jail. Uh, and uh, SBF was a huge proponent of uh, effective altruism. Indeed, uh, he, he was an, a massive financial supporter of the effective altruism movement and uh, the effective altruism causes. And arguably, he started his company uh, and his whole crypto business as a, an effective altruistic act. We'll, we'll get to the context for that in a minute, uh, how, how that kind of comes about. But uh, the whole collapse, uh, uh, the collapse of his empire, the, the, the bankrupting of the, his crypto exchange, and ultimately uh, him landing up in jail, uh, you know, all, all resonated with people through kind of a, uh, this idea that he was the most prominent, the wealthiest, uh, the most actively engaged, uh, effective altruist anybody had ever heard of. And look, look at the corruption. So I don't think that's fair to effective altruism uh, to to condemn it because of the actions of one person. So I'm not going to. We'll condemn effective altruism for other reasons. But um, SBF brought it right to the headlines. And then again, over the last two weeks, uh, effective altruism has made the headlines as a consequence of the role uh, many advocates of effective altruism have played in the drama at OpenAI. Uh, it's still not exactly clear what happened there, but uh, uh, it, it is clear that for effective altruistic reasons, uh, it might have been that the board fired um, uh, Sam Altman. It might be other people within the effective altruism movement who brought him back. And But effective altruism has basically been portrayed as driving a lot of these events and, and, uh, and behind a lot of this. Uh, generally, as a, um, as a philosophy ideology of, uh, of tech, people involved in tech, although not just people involved in tech, there are quite a few academics at Oxford University and elsewhere around the, the world who are uh, uh, advocates for effective uh, altruism. It comes out of uh, the work of some uh, academics at Oxford, but originally uh, from a uh, Australian philosopher uh, whose name, for some bizarre reason, has just escaped me. I, I count on having these available to me, but somebody in the chat will remind me um, uh, of his name. Uh, it, so this is this is a movement that's been around for at least 10 years. Uh, it seemingly is um, a movement of, of I'd say, uh, Peter Singer. Thank you, Ian. Peter Singer, the, the, the ethicist, uh, the Australian uh, philosopher, altruistic philosopher. Um, effective altruism seems to be a movement of young people. There seems to be a movement of tech people, of super smart people. Uh, it is often associated with another movement that is very typical of uh, Silicon Valley, which is the rationalist movement. Uh, and, and there were a lot of uh, similarity and overlap between uh, the effective altruism movement and the rationalist uh, and the rational movement. The effective altruism certainly has had a big impact, I think, um, on, th uh, uh, on Silicon Valley, on tech people, on uh, the kind of tech projects that I think to some extent get funded. I think it's had a, a real profound impact on, on the Valley and, and how the Valley 
thinks about morality, thinks about ethics, uh, and, and thinks about, quote, doing uh, good. Uh, what else do I want to... Uh, so what I want to do today uh, is, is I, 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 will, I will look at... I, I want us to look at two effective altruism projects. And then what I want to do today is try to understand effective altruism um, from the perspective of one effective altruistic intellectual um, who I have a lot of respect for, outside of his effective altruism uh, 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 focus, and that is uh, uh, Scott Alexander, who is, um, God, why, uh, Astral Codex 10. Why is this web page not cooperating? Kind of doesn't really want to open. Come on, open properly. Anyway, so I want to, ta I want to talk about um, Astral Codex 10. If you remember, I talked quite a bit about him uh, during COVID, and then afterwards, I, I, I followed his uh, Substack uh, for a few years now. Uh, I think he did some of the best work on ivermectin in terms of analyzing all the studies and then reviewing his work uh, after the fact. And and uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll tell you what I like about him, and that I think will be reflected also in um, in oh God. Yeah, I'm having internet problems. I'm not sure why. This new uh, the browsers have problems with certain. Anyway, so we will look at Astral Codex 10's decision to uh, donate his kidney and um, how he was motivated to do that by effective altruism, why he did it, what he says his motivations were, because I think that'll tell us a lot about, uh, again, effective altruism. But also, I want to go through how he made the decision, kind of walk through the thinking, the data he looked at, um, because again, I think this will tell us a lot about how effective altruism believes that we should make decisions in our lives, moral decisions in our lives. Uh, I, I mean, we'll talk about what it even views as morality, but how it, 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 it uh, assumes we should uh, behave in our lives and what kind of approach we should take uh, uh, to that. One of the things I really, really like about Astral Codex 10, Scott Alexander, is that he is um, very astute when it comes to analytics and when it comes to, if you will, decision science and when it comes to um, probability and statistics and econometrics, uh, medical studies and things like that. And uh, that was really good during COVID and, and, and other times, but it's also in other analysis, but it's also really interesting to see how he applies this to decision-making when it comes to ethics, when it comes to morality. Uh, so, uh, so that we're gonna spend most of our time going through this idea of the kidney, but just to give you an, uh, some more sense about, so, uh, you know, effective altruism basically is, is altruistic. So it says, uh, and it's, it's, it's a particular form of altruism. The form of altruism effective altruism adopts is utilitarianism. So it is a utilitarian philosophy. Basically, you should do, you should act in a way that maximizes uh, the, the well-being of others. Um, and uh, how do you measure well-being? Uh, the variety of different ways. One of the things they do is they, they measure it through reduction of suffering. They measure it through uh, extension of life, uh, addition of life years where those life years wouldn't have happened. So preventing death, uh, uh, saving people from death. Uh, and uh, so th those are kind of the measures uh, that, they, uh, that they adopt. And they're very, the thing about effective altruism is they want to be effective. So they're very scientific. They're very data driven. Uh, they want to see clear results. They only support uh, uh, charities that where you can see those direct results. And uh, the whole idea is to live a life, not just in your charity, but to live a life that ultimately contributes to a better world and therefore ultimately maximizes the utility of society, that maximizes utility across society. Uh, that, is, uh, that is the, uh, you know, the, the, the fundamental utilitarian idea and they take it very seriously. So for example, uh, there's a website called 80,000hours.org, 80,000hours.org, you can find it. And, in, and, and, and this is what the front page of this says. You have 80,000 hours in your career. 
I guess they've calculated that's probably what you're going to spend time at work. This makes it your best opportunity to make a positive impact on the world. If you're fortunate enough to be able to use your career for good, but aren't sure how, our career guide can help you. It has great new ideas for fulfilling careers that do good, compare your options, different careers and how, mu how much good they do, make a plan you feel comfortable with. It's based on 10 years of research alongside academics at Oxford, and it's a non-for-profit and they're providing this for free. They say our career guide covers everything you need to know about how to find a fulfilling career that does good. From why you shouldn't follow your passion, don't follow your passion, and why medicine and charity work aren't always the best ways to help others. It's full of practical tips and exercises. And at the end, you'll have a draft of your new career plan, all oriented not around your passion, not about your interest, not around what really you think is going to provide you with the most fulfillment and, and drive you towards your values. But really, it's geared towards how you will do the most good as defined as some kind of utilitarian maxim that uh, some kind of, uh, you, you know, maximizing the good of the most people out there. Uh, again, based on extensive research, and you know, we, we, I'm sure we could challenge a lot of the research and challenge a lot of the thinking behind this. Uh, you know, some of the people, uh, there's a lot of people associated with it, big names, uh, uh, Cass Sunstein, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and a bunch of people of Silicon Valley. Uh, and and uh, let me just say something uh, before we get to this, that uh, this is not some leftist, because I know there are going to be people just, as, oh, well, you know, more crap on the left. A lot of the people who adhere to this uh, consider themselves, I'd say, small L libertarians. Uh, a lot of the people that adhere to this are, are, are kind of a, a certainly right of center on a variety of different topics. Uh, for example, I think, I think um, uh, Brian Kaplan, the uh, libertarian philosopher, is sympathetic I think I'm not misrepresenting him by saying he's sympathetic to effective altruism, maybe more than sympathetic. Uh, Hanania, you know, uh, 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 who, who I've talked about often, um, is, um, is uh, quite sympathetic to effective altruism. Uh, so this is attractive to a lot of kind of people who view themselves as super rational um, and who are, have accepted what you would consider conventional morality, that is altruism. And this is a way to be rationally, in quotes, altruistic, right? So one, one idea ab about choosing a career, for example, which SBF took seriously, was one possibility is going to finance or going to something where, you know, you might not love it, but you can make a lot of money at it. You're really talented at it, and you can make a lot of money at it. And, and, and that's good because even though the career itself doesn't, from a utilitarian perspective, doesn't help the world, you can then use that money to give charity, and that'll help the world. So your career helped the world through the amount of money that you produced, and you can use that money for, 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 for charity, which helps the world, right? So it's, again, all focused on what impact can I have out there in the world on other people, on their lives. And again, it's all, it's all systematized. So there's a, literally a website, an, an extensive website, really well, you know, really a nice website. You know, it's well done. Uh, you can tell these are, these are smart people from Silicon Valley that probably have marketing degrees and stuff like that. And uh, a, a lot of articles, a lot of videos, um, and, and a guide and a thing to walk through and figure out what career should you choose to maximize your potential impact on the world out there. Uh, uh, you know, and, and of course, one of the interesting things, and I'm, I'm curious how Brian views this, um, Brian Kaplan, is they don't, they're not economists, and, and they, many of them have a very, very weak understanding of economics. But you would think, you would think that one of the primary things that an effective altruist, if you really cared about life and wealth and uh, alleviating poverty and, and helping save lives and, and stuff like that, is one of the things they would ad be strong advocates for is economic freedom. Now, some of them are, but, it, but it's certainly not 
uniform. They are, again, this is to their credit, they are, most of them are pro-economic growth. They, they realize that economic growth is good. They don't always connect economic growth with freedom. They don't always economic, economic growth with individual rights because I don't think the conception of individual rights, they would have one. But they are very much behind the yes in my backyard movement. They are very much behind the uh, pro-build, pro-growth, pro-tech, pro-the future. So they're not part of this doomerist, for the most part, doomerist um, uh, climate change is going to kill us all, AI, you know, maybe they're on the AI front they are, but, uh, but they, for the most part, they tend to be very pro-science, pro-technology, pro-growth. So the, the, the uh, progress movement that I know Jason Crawford, who I've interviewed on the show before, is very much a, uh, was very much a, a part of the progress movement, uh, has a lot of effective altruists in it. So these are not your typical lefties who want to shut everything down for the sake of Mother Nature or Mother Earth or something like that. These are people who want, at least claim to want, human life on planet Earth to be better. But that's it. That's their moral imperative. There's another page that you can go to if you're so inclined. Give what you can, give what we can, dot org. And here you can go and you can pledge, as, you know, whatever you can, however much you can, a meaningful portion of your income they would like, a meaningful portion. Uh, but they, they, they will accept only 10% if that's, that's what you want to do. They will accept 10%. And they will make it very easy for you. They will auto-deduct it from your checking account or whatever. And then they will allocate it to the most efficient, effective, effective altruism, charities possible. And they, they again, beautiful website, a lot of information. Uh, they, they specify all the research they've done, how that research works, what that research is focused on. Uh, they've got giving guides. They've got the whole thing. I mean, Wow. I mean, I really wish some of our um, objectivist websites were this good, you know, this detailed, this effective. I mean, they, they, it's, these are pros. They know what they're doing. All right, so that's kind of a broad, uh, you know, sense what effective altruism is, uh, how it's known. Um, again, the idea is, a utilitarian idea is to help the world. So let's delve into this idea of, uh, which I'm sure you've all had thoughts about, you've all considered, uh, which is, and I don't know why this is doing it. I, I think the Substack has some kind of quirk in it. Let's, let, me, let me try something different. I'm, I've got this website open with, um, oh, okay, it opened it now. All right, so here's the thing about uh, if you're an altruist, in, in particularly if you're an effective altruist and driven by science, all of us have two kidneys. But we don't really need two kidneys in order to live. You know, with one kidney, we do fine, and we'll get into some of the stats around one kidney in a minute. But the reality is we have two kidneys, and we could give up one kidney, and a lot of people uh, do this for family members, and uh, they, they donate a kidney. Somebody has a kidney disease. Their kidneys are failing. They need a, 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 a kidney uh, transplant. Kidney transplants are very effective. Uh, there's a lot of science behind them. They've been done many times. They add significant numbers of years for the person who's receiving the transplant. The body, uh, we now have techniques on how to do this transplant, transplant without the body rejecting the kidney. And, um, and, and you know, we, we know that this is done. Now, years ago, maybe 10 years ago, somebody showed me an article about a guy who took his altruism seriously and donated a kidney. And we like laughed and how nutty and crazy he is and how, wow. I mean, it, it seemed to me at the time, all right, this is like, you know, nobody does this. Like this guy's weird. This guy's completely insane. Like I know people who do it for loved ones, family members. And even then it's hard because you have to match blood types. But for somebody to just donate a kidney to a stranger, just donate a kidney to go to whoever, that's weird and unusual and, and, and sacrificial and altruistic and doesn't make any sense to me. When my life is a standard, it doesn't make any sense. And I thought, okay, well, you know, there are people who take the altruism seriously, but they're not that many. 
right? It turns out that that guy wasn't an aberration, at least not today, not in the world we live in today. That they are, this is quite popular among the effective altruist community. That many of them have donated a kidney because it makes sense. If you're an altruist and they take their altruism seriously. So here's the, here's the thinking behind this. Uh, so I want to go through, uh, hopefully you find this interesting, but I want to go through, I do anyway, uh, 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 Astro Codex's tens uh, reasoning. He says, years ago, he read an article by a guy who had given up his kidney, had donated a kidney. Um, and <laughs> I'm glad you're keeping your kidneys, uh, Jennifer. Absolutely. I'm keeping mine without anticipating anybody's going to need them. I just like having my kidneys. Um, anyway, he, he describes, uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew, what's his name? Matthew, uh, Dylan Matthew. Dylan Matthew is well known. I guess he's also well known in the, uh, EI, uh, effective altruism community. And six years ago, uh, Matthews uh, donated a kidney. And he described it as, quote, the most rewarding experience of his life. And, and this, is, this is the paragraph that really had an impact on uh, Astral Codex. And then he said, as I'm, as, I'm no doubt the first, as I'm no doubt the first person to notice, being an adult is hard. You're constantly faced with choices about your career, about your friendships, about your romantic life, about your family that have deep moral consequences. And even when you try the best you can, you're going to get a lot of these choices wrong. And you more often than not won't know if you got them wrong or right. You just won't know because you don't have an alternative universe where you did the other thing. And you, uh, maybe you should have picked another job where you could do more good. Notice the standard. Maybe you should have done, gone to grad school. Maybe you should have moved to a new city. So I selfishly, deeply gratified to have made at least one choice in my life that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt was the right one. That's a choice to give the kidney. Um, anyway, uh, Astro Codex then says he read this and was inspired by it and it really moved him. And, and so he started to look at the stats, you know, what, what's involved in giving a kidney. I mean, this is what e e effective altruists do. They look at the data. So he says, okay, well, the risk of death in surgery is 3.1 in 10,000 or 1.3 in 10,000 if, like me, you don't suffer from hypertension. So the risk of death is 1.3 in 10,000. Um, for comparison, that's a little higher in a, 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 a little lower, respectively, than the risk of a pregnancy-related death in the U.S. Um, the risk isn't zero. This is still major surgery. But death is extraordinarily rare. Instead, there's no good evidence that donating reduces your life expectancy at all. So you could do this and not reduce your life expectancy. And the risk of dying is only... I emphasize only 1.3 in 10,000. I don't know, 1.3 in 10,000 for a optional procedure, because this is major surgery. I mean, that's not trivial. It's not zero. It's not one in 100,000. Um, pro optional procedures? I, I, I'm curious, are there forms of, of, of um, medical procedures that people do kind of that are optional, plastic surgery, other things? I wonder what, what the risk of death is in those circumstances. Uh, that would be interesting to measure. Anyway, you see how the thinking was 1.3, 10,000. That's not a lot. It's like dying and giving birth, and that never ha almost never happens. So. And then it says the procedure does not increase your risk of kidney failure, but the average donor still has only a 1% to 2% chance of that happening. The vast majority of donors, 98 to 99%, don't have kidney failure later on. And those who do have kidney failure, you've only got one then, uh, get bumped up on the list to get a donation themselves. Because they gave a donation, they get bumped up uh, uh, to the top of the list to get a donation. Um, so this is the data. So then he, he goes deeper in. Uh, well, but to get 
the cat. I mean, this is, I, I'm just giving you this as an, a sense of how these people's minds work. Okay, but it turns out that to, to, to get a kidney transplant, you need to have a CT, a CAT scan of the abdominal. So, um, and it turns out that, you know, CAT scans we know have radiation. The radiation of a CAT scan like this increases your odds of dying from cancer caused by the radiation by one in 660. You know, it's still low, but it's significant. It's not clear how you measure that. It's not clear exactly what that means. It's not clear how right that is. It, 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 when I read this for the first time, it kind of scared me a little bit because I've had several CAT scans. Now I'm really worried because several CAT scans, that means, you know, anyway, I don't have cancer. I'm pretty sure of that. Right now, I've done pretty much every test to tell, and I don't have cancer right now, but we'll test again next year and see, right? Um, anyway, so, okay, but so that's kind of a risk. Okay, so you talk to the doctor, and the doctor said, okay, if you're really concerned about that, we can do an MRI instead of a CAT scan. Woo, all right, there's one risk eliminated. And then what about, um, you know, what about um, uh, this kidney failure? And, uh, you, you know, and he goes through the whole analysis of how much of the kidney you, 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 you need as you get older and what are the chances that your kidney will fail because you've only got one and it's working harder. A whole statistical analysis. And the bottom line is there were a lot of studies about this and that the chances, according to him, the chances of you actually dying because you only have one kidney instead of two, are basically very, very small. Uh, again, pretty negligible, pretty negligible. So he decided this year to do it. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of, uh, you know, you go through hell in order to just be accepted as a donor. Blood tests, scans, psychological evals, psychiatric eval, all kinds of evals, they take you through uh, it, 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 you know, it's it's a major hassle. He, had, you know, he got it done in New York. So he had a flight in New York from California twice. Just that would turn me off the whole thing. I mean, just the time. Think of the time you're consuming to do that. But he figured, you know, um, it'll extend somebody's life by, let's say, ten years. So it's ten life years. To extend somebody, to extend, to buy 10 life years through charity, you would have to probably give up about, donate about $10,000 in Africa. You know, so it's $10,000 of this, or maybe you could do both. You could save two people 10 life. Seems like a worthwhile thing to spend all this energy and time and effort. There was one line here that I thought was really interesting that surprised me that he would admit it. Uh, let me see if I can find this. Um, because, um, let me see if I can find this. It, it was, uh, it was important, I thought, because it, it tells you a little bit, um, I mean, here, here's a, here's a good line and not the line I wanted. I'll find out one as well. Um, oh, here it is. Here it is. Um. And uh, ta -ta 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 she says, um, well, one of the things he says is, um, you know, when I talk to my EAA friends, effective altruism friends, the reaction was at least, and told them that he was getting a kidney transplant. The reaction was at least cool. Wow. But pretty often it was, oh yeah, I donated two years ago. Want to see my skull? Most people don't do interesting things unless they're in a community where those things have been normalized. I was blessed with a community where this was so normal that I could read a Vox article about it and not vomit it back out. So here's a community that supports people donating their kidney. It's a community that supports altruistic acts. And that's important to it because he wants the support of this community. There's a, there's, a lot, there's a number of things in this article that he writes that are very second-handed. Like you donate a kidney, you get instant altruism credit. Like there's no, 
There's no um, like other motive that could drive you to donate a kidney other than altruism. So you get straight out altruist credit for doing it. Um, so uh, he thought that was really cool, right? Again, a, a, a second-handedness that I guess should not be surprising that it comes uh, that it comes from a, from an altruist. Here's the way uh, here's the way he writes about about the the, the trade off, right? This is um, he says kidney donation is only medium effective as far as altruism goes. Medium effective, interesting. The average donation buys the recipient about five to seven extra years of life. Uh, beyond the current factual of dialysis. It also improves quality of life from about 70% of a healthy average to about 90%. Non-directed kidney donations can also help the organ bank solve allocation problems around matching donors and recipients of different blood types. So, you know, it, uh, it's, it's somewhat beneficial. He says that this is great. My grandfather died of kidney disease and 10 to 20 more years with him would have meant a lot. But it only costs about five to ten thousand dollars to produce this many quality life years through bog standard effective altruistic interventions like buying mosquito nets from malarial regions in Africa. So, you know, you're indifferent between giving a kidney or giving ten thousand dollars for mosquito nets in Africa. It's about get you the same stuff. I mean, think about the mental gymnastics that you're going through in order to justify ripping your body apart, going through major surgery. He describes his recovery from surgery, which is not, not pleasant at all. It's major abdominal surgery. <sighs> now, of course, effective altruists measure everything. They, they, they look at the most effective thing, how they're using their money the most effective way constantly evaluating alternatives, which is to the credit. <laughs> it's the goal that is very problematic. He writes to, quote, I worry that people use suffering as a heuristic for goodness. Remember, we've talked about this a lot when we talked about uh, altruism, that ultimately, for many people, it's suffering that is the heuristic for altruism, for goodness, for good action. Well, he worries about the same thing. He wants, this is kind of a, a, an altruism that takes the other seriously, is not focused on the suffering of the individual. Uh, although, if they really cared about the other, again, you would think they would focus much more on economic freedom and economic liberty as, as their primary focus. But anyway, so he says, Mother Teresa becomes a hero because living with lepers in Calcutta slums sounds horrible. So anyone who does it must be really charitable, regardless of whether or not the lepers get helped. This is, by the way, Kant's argument. Kant makes the argument that if you meet somebody who's happy and successful, beware, because they, they're probably not moral, because they're probably not altruistic. They're probably selfish, and that's a dangerous person. So happiness, success, well-being is associated with selfishness. Suffering suggests charity, suggests uh, helping others, suggests not thinking of yourself. Right? Now, he says, he goes on to say, this heuristic, the heuristic of suffering, isn't terrible. <laughs> if you're suffering for your charity, then it must seem important to you, and you're obviously not doing it for personal gain. Now, that's interesting how, how the, again, the mental gymnastics. It's important to you, but it's not for personal gain. What does it mean if something is important to you, but not a personal gain? Does he associate personal gain only for money, about money? Or is personal gain a broader concept? But if it's important for you, to you, doesn't it also mean that you view it as a personal gain? If you do charity in a way that benefits you, then the personal gain aspects start looking suspicious. The problem is the people, like if you're enjoying yourself, you're having fun, you, you really love what you're doing, uh, you know, helping other people, then it looks suspicious. The problem is the people, I'm quoting from him, the problem is the people who evaluate it 
from a suspicion to an automatic condemnation. It seems like such a natural thing to do. And it encourages people uh, to be masochists, sacrificing themselves pointlessly in photogenic ways instead of thinking about what will actually help others. In other words, the standard that you should practice is what other people think. And since other people have this bad heuristic, you should match that heuristic. And he says this isn't good, not because you don't care about what other people think, but because you might not be as an effective and altruist as you should be in terms of helping other people. Then he says, getting back to the point, kidney donation has an unusual high ratio of photo, this is unbelievable, kidney donation has an unusual high ratio of photogenic suffering to altruistic gain. So why do a, a effective altruists keep doing it? I can't speak for anyone else, but I speak for myself. It starts with wanting just once to do a good thing that will make people like you more instead of less. It starts with wanting just once to do a good thing that will make people like you more instead of less. It would be morally fraught to do this with money since any money you spend on improving your self-image would be denied to the people in malarial regions of Africa who need it the most. But it's not like there's anything else you could do with that spare kidney. So in other words, he's doing this to make people like him more, to make people admire him more. Now, this is surprising of, uh, uh, of uh, Astral Codex 10. He is a psychiatrist. He's well-respected, well-regarded. He's got this unbelievably successful substack. He's made, I'm sure, a lot of money off the substack and done very, very well professionally. He's married, seemingly happy. But at the end of the day, think of how deep the second-handedness must go. If he's giving his kidney because it has an unusual ratio of photogenic suffering to altruistic gain. He really values the photogenic suffering. I mean, the fact that other people admire him for it. And then he says, still, it's not just about that. <laughs> All of this calculating and funging takes a psychic toll. Your brain uses the same emotional heuristic as anyone else's. No matter how contrarian you pretend to be, deep down it's hard to make your emotional tra emotions track what you know is right. A lot of objectivists would sympathize with that. And not what the rest of the world is telling you. So the nice thing about this is there's no, you don't have to calculate. The amount of research you have to do is limited. It's pretty simple. You give up a kidney, doesn't do you much harm by giving it up. And somebody else benefits, and it's clean, it's simple, it's straight-out altruism w w without all the heuristic brain damage that these people go through. Now, of course, he, he describes his time at the hospital, which is very unpleasant. He describes the sound effects, the side effects that are very unpleasant. I, I, I just don't see how you, you don't weigh this at all. And, but at the end of the day, what matters is he helped somebody else. I do find this interesting. He, he, at the end of the article, he writes, in polls, 25 to 50% of Americans say they would donate a kidney to a stranger in need, which is weird because there's 100,000 strangers on a waiting list for kidney transplants constantly. Many of them, 5,000 or 40,000 die each year because there aren't enough kidneys. So there's five to 40,000 people, strangers in need that your kidney could help. So it is interesting that they say that. Are they saying it a virtue signal, but these are anonymous surveys. Are they saying it a virtue signal to themselves, which I think a lot of virtue signaling is not about other people, but it's to yourself. It's virtue signaling to yourself. It wouldn't take a large percentage of those 25 to 50% to take it seriously, donate a kidney to a stranger and solve the problem. Of course, the problem could be solved as Astral Codex 
10 acknowledges simply by creating a market for organs, as Millet is claiming he's going to do in Argentina, make it legal to trade in organs, to sell your organs. And then you would solve this problem for good. And to uh, Astro Codex 10's credit, he acknowledges that. I guess what's sad about this whole thing, I mean, he, he's got another article where he describes all the good uh, 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 effective altruists have made in the world. Um, they, they, they have the calculation. They know how much money they've given as a movement. They know what it's gone for. They know how much lives they've saved. They've, they've uh, you know, they've saved 200,000 lives. They've, uh, 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 you know, reduced the occurrence of malaria significantly. I mean, they have, they have detailed lists of this stuff. I mean, yeah, saved about 200,000 lives, mostly from malaria, treated 25 million cases of chronic parasite infection, given 5 million people access to clean drinking water, supported critical trials for both malaria vaccine uh, that has been approved uh, and one that's in track, supported additional research into vaccines for syphilis, malaria, and other things, supported teams giving developmental economics. They're also big on animal welfare, so they, they're big on uh, not having animals not suffer in commercial uh, uh, farming. They're big on AI and all the, all the protections and restrictions on AI, although one of the big, uh, biggest uh, effective altruist people out there is this Eliezo something who, um, who, who is a, do, I, 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 I attended a, 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 a kind of a panel that he was on. The world's going to end. AI is going to kill us all. There's no question about that. And you know, very doom and gloom. But yet he's credited for a lot of the AI development. Uh, a lot of the people in AI, I, I admire him. The effective altruists have created all kinds of control to prevent AI from going nuts and killing us all. Um, on top of that, they've, they've done stuff in biotech. They've done stuff in a bunch of different things. So they have a whole list of all the benefits. Yudowski, Udo, something like that, yes. Um, so according to Astral Codex 10, they've done a lot of good in the world in terms of by their standards, helping others for the dollars that they invest. Um, and you, good, I mean, if you're going to give to charity, do it effectively. Figure out what effectively means to you. Uh, I still think the most effective charity possible to, if you care about human life and you care about poverty is to promote liberty and to promote freedom. Um, but here you get concrete human lives. You, here you get concrete chickens who are not suffering anymore because they're free range now. Here you get concrete saving the world from AI. So uh, it, it, obviously they value that more than others. There's also a, a, a portion of a, a effective altruism that cares about the distant future, like a million years from now, and that is completely paralyzing and ridiculous. There's no, it's hard enough to do the heuristics, the math, the probabilities on effect, being effective today in, in, a, in a period of time you can project into the future. They don't want to project generations in the future. It was completely ridiculous. So here's the thing. What's really tragic about this movement here are really a lot of very smart people. But they're not just smart. The people who take their ideas seriously, the people who want to do what they believe is right and good, they are diligent and they are thoughtful and they are, you know, they, 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 they want to align their emotions with their values. They, they, uh, and they want to, they want, they, they, they take whatever ethical code they have, this idea of utilitarianism, which I think is fraught with contradictions and conflicts and problems, but put that aside. I'm sure they've got answer to every, everything I, whether it's a good answer or not is a different question. And then they go all in on it and they're committed to it. And overall, their ideology is not the kind of ideology where you fear people going all in, to, 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 like, you know, the Nazis were all in, the communists were all in. And these people are less harmful, put it that way, at least to the rest of us. They might be harmful to themselves, but to the rest of us. And they're smart. 
and they love science, they love technology, they, they want to apply uh, uh, reason, they, they are part of what's called the rationalist community, which is again an attempt to apply reason, primarily through statistical analysis, unfortunately, but facts, data, knowledge, to problem solving. The problem they want to solve for is morality. And the tragedy here is, I mean, really the tragedy here is that they've just accepted a conventional morality. They've accepted a false morality. They've accepted, you know, I think the best version maybe of this false morality. But a false morality nonetheless. They, and, and many of them, let's be clear, many of them have been exposed to Ayn Rand. This is the kind of community that has probably read Ayn Rand, met objectivists. Again, Jason Crawford knows a lot of these people. Um, certainly know of Rand, know of Alice Shrugged. And yet, and I think maybe part of that is, is, is uh, 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 Astral Codex tends admitting that he cares what other people think a certain conventionality, a certain second-handedness, which almost always goes with altruism, because altruism is, of course, about the other, and therefore you care about what the other thinks. It's the other you're trying to please. But it's a shame. It's tragic. I mean, one of Freeman says these people are not very creative, but they are. Outside of their effective altruism, they are. These, uh, uh, many of them are founders of internet companies. Many of them are innovators. Many of them uh, are tech entrepreneurs. A lot of them at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence right now, at AI. Um, these people are creative. They're not creative when it comes to this particular area in their life. But I, I view it as tragic more than anything else. I, I see the immense human potential that exists here, the, 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 the talent that they have. And they're devoting it to something that is completely wrong, self-destructive, not even benevolent. I'm not going to give my kidney to a stranger for the simple reason that, uh, you know, I, it's just not worth it for me. The hassle, the pain, the risk, they might claim there's no risk, but I don't completely buy their stats of, of living with just one kidney instead of two. Uh, I intend to live a long life. I, you know, I might need to, particularly as you go along, your kidneys become less effective and two is better than having one. And if one goes out, I don't want to rely on somebody else donating a kidney to me. And what if, as Jennifer says, you know, somebody I love has kidney failure and then I, I would donate the kidney because their life is important to me. There's so many possibilities that relate directly to my personal values versus helping a stranger. Helping a stranger is not that important to me. I'm way too focused on my own life, my own values, my own happiness. Choosing a career so that I can maximize the benefit to other people? Why? choose a career that benefits my own happiness. So the whole framework is wrong. The whole utilitarianism is wrong. But here's a group different than, let's say, the Christian altruists, the Mother Teresa type altruists, who are not necessarily suffering or explicitly suffering or suffering to the extent that a Mother Teresa would suffer, but are still acting altruistically. And what's amazing about them is doing so consciously. Most people have their altruism, but they don't dwell on it and think about it and strategize around it and plan around it. These people do. I don't know. I guess I'm, um, I'm impressed by their commitment. I wish we had more rational egoists, effective egoists, as... Uh, Don will describe them, who were this committed. And I wish our movement was this big, 
had this kind of money and was focused on teaching people to think in the right way so that they could bring themselves out of poverty, think in the right way so they could demand their own liberty and their own freedom and make the world richer. Think the right kind of way so that first and foremost could make their own life happier, better, more effective. Oh, Gene says, I'm just going to read this because this seems super relevant. Gene says, funny, effective altruism was part of my path to objectivism. An objectivist friend pointed out how Bill Gates, the businessman, did way more for the world than Big Gates, the philanthropist. That was a huge mental shift. Yeah, and here's the thing. Your friend got it from me because I'm the one who made a big deal out of that comparison in my talk on the morality of capitalism 12, 15, 13, 14 years ago, and since I've repeated it a hundred and something times. So that is my shtick, the Bill Gates stuff. So tell your friend, stop stealing my stuff. No, please steal my stuff as much as you can. The more you steal the, my stuff, the better. And I, 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 I take it as a compliment. But anyway, the more important thing is, yes, that's one step in the shift. But the second step in the shift is it's not about changing the world. It's about your own life. It's about your own happiness. It's about your own success. It's about the one life that you have that ends at some point and is gone and disappears and you don't get it back. Might as well, when you're living it, make the most of it. That's what it's about. And that's not captured by that Bill Gates example. The Bill Gates example is to show that, that people seem to care more about hating selfishness, hating the benefit you get, than caring about the good you do out there, which is a point Scott Alexander makes in his essay as well. And why he says the nice thing about kidney is they can't say I benefited from it. I did not benefit from it. So he can make the claim that his is pure altruism, which is what makes it wrong, which is what makes it evil. It's a wrong choice to give a kidney to a stranger. You better have really, really good explanation for how that is rationally in your self-interest to do it. I don't see it. I don't see it. <laughs>